Hello, hello, hello. That's better. Um, no, very good question. And when, and when I think about it, I mean, that, that's what I'm always looking for. And um, for example, when I first went to the Amazon in 1993, uh, trying to catch Arapaima, I thought, OK, I, I knew that the local people uh, spear them, net them. And I just thought, right, I'm just going to go somewhere that's, that's really remote, where, where, where the subsistence fishermen and the people who, who hunt them to sell aren't going to go. And I basically started asking around. They said, forget it. You know, they, they get everywhere. They will drag their canoes through literally miles of forest to, to, to get to these backwater lakes and things. Um, yeah, but places do exist. I mean, there are places in Alaska. Uh, well, I say, you know, Alaska is not totally wild, but it's very well managed. Uh, on the whole, um, but no, really, really wild water is is something that is extremely rare, and if you find some, it's it's very precious, and it's it's decreasing all the time. Oh God. I think the answer to that for me is really easy. It was my dear departed father. Um, he took me fishing when I was eight, nine, saltwater fishing on the Malacca Straits. Um, I used to live in Malaya, and it was great just to be able to experience being out in the wilds um, catching fishes. Fabulous. Yep. Well, same again, my dad, <laughs> as most probably will be, right, if you're lucky, right, if you're lucky. My dad had a, he started a fly fishing school in Kent when I was six, and so I was brought up with a pond in the back garden that he dug out and he, he put in some goldfish, and little did we know at the time that goldfish breed, we know that now, and these, there were two goldfish in this uh, in this neighbor's pond about the size of this table, and there's always two goldfish. And there's always two goldfish for years and years and years. And then they, they had a baby, um, and they wanted to fill the pond in so the baby didn't die, fall in. So they gave us the goldfish, and we put these goldfish in this pond, uh, our pond, and our pond was probably half an acre. And very soon we had 10,000 goldfish swimming around. So my dad, being an entrepreneur, thought this is a brilliant idea to make some money. So he paid me and my sister one P per goldfish we would catch, <laughs> one pence. So we'd go out with bread, and I was six at this time, and I'd go out with bread, and my sister would go out, and we'd catch a bunch of goldfish, put them in the keep net, give them to Dad, and he sold them for a quid to the local pet shop. I thought, I got a bit of sense after two years of doing this, thinking, it's, I'm being ripped off here. So we went on strike. My sister and I went on strike. So we're not doing any more of this until we go two peer fish. And my dad, being stubborn as he always was, said, nope, one pea. Oh, I'm going to net the thing and sell them all to a commercial pet shop. And he did. <laughs> he netted the hapon, took out all the goldfish, stocked it with trout, and thus begun my fly fishing life. <laughs> so that's my inspiration. <laughs> um, <coughs> it's going to be a hat trick here. It's my father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my father was in the army, so we lived in various places. And when I started, we were living in Nigeria. So as a five-year-old there's not much you can do in Nigeria especially back in those days but the one thing we did find there was a little pond on a, a sort of safe bit of land that I could go and fish and that was pretty much most of my days most of my evenings and then it sort of went from there various places across the world but about eight years old we moved, eventually moved back to the UK and my father decided that he'd always wanted to learn how to fly fish so he would go off and get a lesson come back and try and impart that onto me and now tells me that he's taught me everything that I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks. <laughs> right, I'm going to deviate from the, the pattern so far. Nobody in my family fished, so I, when I first took it up, I, I was pretty much on my own, and I was very unsuccessful. This is aged about seven or eight to start with, and I thought this is the most pointless thing anybody dreamt up. You're standing there getting rained on, and it's miserable, and, and nothing happens. Uh, eventually, um, I started to catch fish, but there was a, a local legendary character. I'd occasionally see him over the fields, and this one local guy, and he used to catch these big chub and pike and even carp from the river. This is the, the Suffolk store. 
And he was the local cobbler. We don't really have those anymore, the shoe repairer. And um, he, was a, he was a deaf mute. He couldn't hear, he couldn't speak. And I, I would um, go to his workshop occasionally and we would have conversations on, um, he had a, a chalkboard and some chalk and, and, and he would sort of, you know, too chub yesterday. I, 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 he would sort of occasionally make noises, but he, he uh, yeah, he was, he was the local expert by far, um, but quite a sort of a secret character. And uh, he was the person that, that sort of got me to realize that, that, uh, that it's possible to extract surprising fish out of places where you wouldn't expect them if you just tuned in to, to the fish somehow. So, um, like Jeremy, I, my parents didn't actually fish when I first started, but a friend of mine um, who I used to go and play with, I was probably about five, uh, he had uh, a moat at the end of the garden. Uh, sort of the house was part of what was... Moat. Yes. <laughs> 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 the drawbridge and a portcullis <laughs> and stuff. No. So let me elaborate. <laughs> Didn't like people very much. Um, so uh, he, uh, he was... It was one of the old houses which had then essentially been broken down into a whole series of flats and other bits and pieces. So there was this moat and we used to sit there and watch these huge fish cruising <coughs> around. And uh, I really wanted to catch one. So I, I went home, went to my father, and I said, um, you know, I, I know you used to fish. Do you think you could, if you got a rod or anything like that? So he pulls out this, this old bamboo rod, not a split cane bamboo, literally a rod that was bamboo sections that bolted together with rod rings made out of um, bits of wire taped to it and some old Bakelite reel that he had found with some line on it, which was probably about... 40 years old, and said, there you go, son, off you go. So I took it down, duly put it, what, he, what I told him about these fish, you know, I'd said, these fish, Dad, are huge, and he'd gone, yeah, 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 that's fine, he was thinking I was talking about roach or bream or something like that. They were about 25 pound carp, so I put this bit of sweet corn out and hit this carp, which then essentially annihilated the rod, it just disintegrated, the rings flew off. <laughs> <laughs> the reel came out of the seat um, before it then tore it up through the rest of the guides and then threw it off into the lake. So I went home and I said, Dad, I think I need a new rod. <laughs> I need a bigger rod. <laughs> and he was like, what, what, are you, what have you done to it? And I said, well, look, I've just got this stick. That's all that's left. And I took him down there and I showed him. And then I think the light bulb went on. But he did actually buy me um, another coarse rod and from that got back into fishing himself. And then we started fly fishing when I was about six. And he then gave me some horrendous old steel tank aerial fly rod while he bought himself a brand new hardy carbon fiber rod. And I remember thinking, I really want one of those. <laughs> Why do I get this one? But yeah, so it was kind of me, kind of my father. But then we spent many, many years after that fishing together, which was, which was great. Um, yeah, I'm the same as most of the guys, uh, my father, uh, fishing for both salmon and and then some of the hill lochs, I'm from northern Scotland up in Inverness, the Highlands, so we've no shortage of water and lochs and stuff like that. So very much a uh, um, family affair, going out with my brother and cousins and uh, day trips and stuff like that, fishing. Uh, one thing is uh, important before we move on to Paul is that there's not enough kids fishing nowadays. We're doing a lot of what sport fish have done here is fantastic uh, with a little pond and they're catching sort of. 80 hundred trout out of these ponds each day. Uh, and a woman yesterday in the audience made a fair point that w we were asking kind of how there's not enough youngsters coming into the sport. And a woman made a very valid point that, you know, they, they need adults to take them. You know, there's guys, most of the guys in the panel here have all done their bit to try and promote the youth development within angling. Um, and it's a big thing and it's something we have to make a big thing because there isn't enough uh, coming through. Um, but it is to to think about that side of things where that you know when you do put something together and we do there's so many youngsters that are keen to get into fishing but the parents or that don't fish and stuff like that you know so um, it is something maybe we can back to in the panel here in a wee minute just uh, as a discussion because it is a quite a good thing and it's for the future of the sport and everything and it's you know, it's there's too many. Well, there's too many Xboxes and not enough taco boxes uh, on the go nowadays. So, um, but yeah, for me, it was my father, family affair, 
but we were quite lucky in as much as um, we had a lot of water quite close by, so it was kind of easy for us, so to speak. Pretty much like Jeremy and Peter, uh, there's no sort of angling history in my family. However, as a youngster, well, and we spoke about it yesterday, about and, and Scott's just touched on this, the Xbox, blah, blah, blah. As kids, you entertained yourselves by going up the fields. I'm from a sort of really rural, rural area and terrorising animals, trapping wildlife and things <laughs> like that. I know everybody will go, oh, my God, but that's what you did then. I always had an interest with fish because it's what you couldn't see beneath the surface, surface and it was a mystery. Uh, so I started course fishing, very much like Jeremy, very unsuccessfully for a long time. As a bloke, we kind of know best anyway, and even as a young kid then, you think, yeah, I know how to do it. Didn't read any books, sort of bumbled my way through it. I, and eventually, I was uh, trapped indoors one Sunday afternoon. It was pouring down. Some of you will remember this, hopefully. The Out of Town series with Jack Hargreaves. He was actually fly fishing one Sunday, and I thought, my God, I so want to do that. Um, convinced my parents that they ought to buy me a fly rod for my birthday and everything, like uh, the, the reel, the line, the complete outfit. And that's how it started for me. Uh, this is a question for Jeremy. Uh, in your new series, Dark Waters, you investigate the problem uh, concerning king salmon and their depleting numbers due to orcas. What would be your proposed solution to this problem? Uh, my, my proposed solution, which, which didn't make it into the program, was the fact that um, it's very good news that orcas are, are doing well in that corner of the, the Pacific Ocean. Um, the, the king salmon, all the salmon in Alaska, they, they, you know, there are so many, uh, you know, the, you know, there are so many different groups of people and things that depend on, on the salmon. And that, that fishery is managed, it's been managed for, for a long time. And the thing is, you can't, you can't manage the orcas. And, and what, what they're going to have to do is actually is ease off on the, on the human uh, harvesting for a while to, to let the, the numbers build up because the, you know, the orca thing is, has just come, come in from nowhere and suddenly the numbers are down. I think you know, it's, it's not totally as simple as that, but they, um, I mean, one thing that quite surprised me, they, they have people, so you have your sport fishermen there, you have commercial fishermen there, you also have subsistence fishermen, and some of the subsistence fishermen use commer commercial methods. They use huge nets and they pull in large numbers of fish. And I'm thinking that's not really subsistence fishing. Um, so I think they, they they possibly need to rethink their management a bit. It, it's very political. It's you know there's state versus federal and all the rest of it. But I think um, the thing about salmon is uh, and, and nature generally is if you if you give nature a helping hand, it will do an awful lot itself. So I think. Unfortunate as it is for some people there, just ease up on them a little bit, let the numbers build up again, and and, and then they'll hopefully they'll be they'll be enough for everybody. This one for David. Um, how did you in the seventies or wherever it was go from rock star to fly fisherman? <laughs> Always yeah, wanted to. Heart is coming out. <laughs> um, right, the, there is an answer to that. Um, I did reasonably well, let's say. Uh, you've probably seen films and the like. And the last gig that I played on that planet was uh, topping the bill at the European Symphonic Rock Festival, which was a you know, great event. And I'd been very fortunate in that the Dutch record label that my old band was signed to looked after me incredibly well. Um, they were a filter between me and the, uh, the shitbags who inhabit the music <laughs> industry. And sadly, they went bust. And my thoughts ran along the lines of, do I want to go back to starting something again at the bottom and having to deal with the arseholes? And the answer was, well, no, I don't. I've got a Porsche and a big house. Bollocks, I'm going fishing. And <laughs> 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 Which turned from a, a hobby into a, 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 a very entertaining and interesting career as a guide. 
someone earlier was saying about um, are there any wild waters left to fish? Well, I've fished a lot of wild waters where um, we've got there with float planes right inland in the north of Canada and you're fishing for place, fishing in places that no one has fished. So you, you land in your float plane and someone with drops a boat from above for you and you find it and set it up and you go fishing and it's an amazing experience to do that and be in a place that humans haven't interfered with yet. Um, I count myself really fortunate to have had the opportunities to do things like that. Fabulous. And um, yeah, I have gone back to playing music, which I hadn't intended to do. I, um, and I'm in a, a fortunate position now in that I don't really have to bother about dealing with uh, people on a, a business level. I do as well as I need to. I just smile and enjoy the day and have a, a big, smug, self-satisfied <laughs> glow all the time. It's brilliant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, very fortunate. Um, I, I think in a previous life, I was obviously an incredibly good little boy because the karma is just working for me all the time and it certainly isn't because of recent behavior. <laughs> <laughs> it, it must go back to previous existence. So, yeah, there we go. Desperate well, um, I've dabbled with the Giant Trevally. I know Peter's a, uh, an expert uh, with his book and everything. Um, I haven't caught <laughs> big numbers of them, but they're just sensational. I, I, I know what he's talking about. I like my big wild brown trout, and if you were to say, if there's only one species you can fish for for the rest of your life, it would be wild brown trout. However, in terms of fishing for a species that I really like catching, for me it would be Giant Trevally. <coughs> uh, uh, the same kind of, uh, uh, to a certain extent, kind of, being from Scotland, uh, we got the salmon fishing, and I spent a lot of time now in Norway, and fortunately, caught some, caught some pretty large salmon over there. Um, and Paul's heart is in a, the brown trout. My heart is in Atlantic salmon for sure. But some of that salt water fishing nowadays, fly fishing in the salt, is looks really good. I've, Dabbled it or dipped my toe in the water, so to speak, pardon the pun, with it. Uh, and uh, it looks really good. So, a bit more of that for sure. Uh, giant Trevally and all, you know, tarpon and all these things. And the world's getting a, a smaller place and easier to get to destinations nowadays. So, um, a lot more people are traveling about the world more than they used to. Um, so, that's certainly my bucket list going forward. Yeah, for sure. Right, it can't be GTs. <laughs> no, that's I, I've got GTs, so yeah. <laughs> you stole your Although, thunder. Actually, for me, I go the other way because I've done so much saltwater fishing now that actually freshwater species are the ones which are actually. So, um, for me, I think it's a golden dorado. Um, this is a very large predator species living in rivers um, in South America, which I'm sure Jeremy has encountered on numerous occasions. But there's a particular place in Bolivia. Uh, called Timane, and there is a river system there which has got um, a full fly fishing operation on there. So you are sight fishing for large, aggressive golden dorado with a single-handed fly rod. Now that is something I really, really want to do. What's really annoying is I have someone who works with me who does a lot of it and is very good at it, so I don't have an excuse to go, which is why I haven't done it yet. But you just like them. That's a really good <laughs> idea. <laughs> right, hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Golden Dorado. That's the one that's on my bucket list right now. Right, this answer could be interesting because you've caught most species. Right, it's a two-part answer. The first part is very boring. Uh, yes, there are a few species, but I'm not going to say what they are because uh, I'm sort of keeping them under my hat. I might, en I might end up making <laughs> programs about them. Um, the, s the second part of the answer is um, I, I was talking today about how my familiarity with fly fishing is not is not huge, but. Um, I, I've had a couple of afternoons fishing for, for bonefish 
and I, I think just some salt water uh, fly fishing, you know, flats and around reefs and, and uh, you know, near to the shore, that kind of thing strikes me as, as, as a, a lot of fun. Uh, Travelling light, you're in the sun, amazing fish. Uh, so a bit more of that would be, would be great. Uh, for me, it's a freshwater fish as well. So over the years, done a huge amount of pike fishing and would love to catch a muskie, which is the sort of North American cousin of our pike. Uh, not had the opportunity to do it yet. But it's big and toothy, which is which is always fun. So yeah, I think it'd be a musky at the moment. Well, that's a tough one. I've been thinking about it as it's going down, <coughs> listening to all these answers. And uh, with my job, I'm kind of lucky that we have to product test fly lines for various species. So as soon as a species comes out, we've got to go and test some fly lines for them. So I've, I've caught an awful lot of species um, working. Of course, very hard doing it. But the one that stands out for me actually is a rooster fish which is a, a fish off Baja, Mexico, and down on the Pacific there, which is a stunningly visual fish. And if you've ever seen pictures, I'm sure... You've caught them, Jeremy? Yeah. I've seen pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are stunningly beautiful fish with these beautiful stripes and this huge comb, and they surf in through, and you, you basically target them by walking along the beach or taking an ATV, a kind of quad bite thing, and going along the beach, and you look for these fish surfing through the waves and these big combs coming out. They're very hard fighting, very aggressive. They're hard to catch. They look gorgeous, and so we'll probably have a rooster fish line coming out soon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I can go. <laughs> we call them punk GTs. Do you like them? Yeah. yeah they're awesome. Boom. Awesome. I, I, I was thinking along the same lines as uh, Ben about musky, in that I've caught lots of what the Americans call northern pike, but never caught uh, a musky. Uh, I've enjoyed fishing for poor beagles, which has been a bit extreme, but I confess that um, that's probably something that I'd best avoid now. I think um, there are serious health issues attached to doing that, and the same with any very big fish. I, I had a, a little fantasy about maybe trying for bluefin tuna off the, the Cornish coast, but Again, not that good an idea with a fly rod and no harness mm. and the like. I, I think I would like to just keep being able to keep going back to Canadian wilderness up near the Arctic Circle and fish around the tree line for huge pike and huge lake trout in completely natural settings. It's exciting. And it's all sight fishing as well, which for me just adds an extra dimension to it. Fishing for pike in northern Manitoba is slightly similar to fishing for bonefish on the flats in that you're sight fishing shallow water, clear water, and casting at fish. The difference is well, may maybe someone has better bone fishing than I've experienced, but you can catch 70, 80 pike in a day, averaging probably 12 pounds. Uh, that's pretty exciting sight fishing. It's dramatic, um, yeah. <laughs> I want to do it again. <laughs> right. Any other questions? Right. I've got a question for oh, you. Hold oh, hold on. Have we? Yeah, yes. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. The panel go on point. <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, a, a very quick question from each of you, up to each of you, is um, if you could hold the record for a UK fish, what would it be? Which Mine's fish? very, very simple. Brown trout. There you go. Predictable as ever. Uh, Got I'm going to jump in before Ben Bangham does. <laughs> it's going to be a grayling. <laughs> it has to be Atlantic salmon for me, obviously. Uh, being the north of Scotland, I wouldn't be allowed over the border if I didn't say anything else. I don't think back home. So, yeah, Atlantic salmon. A gudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> a On a <the> fly. <laughs> I was thinking burbots, but uh, no, uh, pike would be something very special. Since I can't have a grayling, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say a perch. Just love them. Big, small fish, if that makes sense. I don't know. I, it's a, uh, not really a, a record kind of person, but uh, if I had to do it and I had to choose a fish just because I want to catch a big one, it would be a sea trout at night. A big British record sea trout, which I know is a brown trout family. It was all those things, but I'm going to call it a sea trout just to be different. <laughs> 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 What's left? Yeah, yeah. There's an eel. It, eel. No, I, for for me it would have to be a pike. Really, just nothing else would would work. 
Right. Is there any last chance? Last question. I've got one for Scott. Um, with just just to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, anybody that lives in London, uh, this Thursday at Fallows, um, they are screening the Artificial, which is the um, the film where Michael Frodeen dived under the cages in Norway and showed the devastation of the farming in the salmon farming industry and the, what's happening to the wild salmon. So if anybody's interested in seeing that, Fallows next Thursday, Thursday the 16th, doors open at 5.30, 6 o'clock the screening. There's a free beer for you as well, so anybody's invited to that. But Scott, I'm going to throw this at you and anybody else in the panel that wants to say, what is the solution to to get rid of or sort out the salmon problem in Scotland? And that is a minefield of a, que uh, of a question. Uh. Try and keep your answers short because we've got <laughs> Jeremy and Simon doing a head-to-head -head at 3 o'clock out on the right. road. Right. Uh, it's a good question. Um, take it on land. Simple as that. It costs a little bit more. Uh, if you look underneath a, a, a cage, if, if fish farming was on land, they would be shut down tomorrow. There's so much pollution, so much going on with it. It is terrible. It really is, and they get away with absolute murder. They really do because it's all hidden under the water. And as like Michael Frodi and his dad, they've gone under and and photographed and filmed what exactly is happening to the seabed, which is desert. It's 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 not good. You, be, you know, um, so they can easily the the salmon and the sea trout, especially sea trout, is a coastal fish around Scotland, feed around the coast. So the sea lice that come off the Cage of sea lice is a natural forming um, parasite, uh, but when they're in an environment where they're, in, they're encaged, they grow, uh, multiply out of control. Uh, little has been done or a bit to uh, eradicate them, and it could be done. The problem is they're all owned by different people, the cages. One de lices and puts chemicals in the water to de lice them, uh, and then all they do is go to the next fish farm, which is uh, not been de at the same time and they just it just they just go round in a circle and it's just moving the problem on what could happen really is it comes on land it'll cost a little bit more you're going to have a far better product uh, there's less chemicals being used um, and it's down to money it really is and let's say the aquaculture industry it's huge and you know i i i'm disappointed being a scot being down here because our government because it's so political this is unbelievable but the Scottish government, the UK government, are totally blinkered on the fact that they are talking about jobs and the revenue coming off fish farming. The problem is it's all automated nowadays, and the job thing, OK, it produces job, but a fishery close to me, uh, Loch Marie, was one of the most famous sea trout fisheries in Scotland. They had 10 full-time gillies employed in that at one time. That was 10 families all living in the area and income, kids in the schools and all the rest of it. Uh, the school's now closed and there's no gillies on it. And yet they've got huge automated fish farms. They get in some sort of foreign workers, nothing wrong with foreign workers, but it's it's a whole impact to the, the, the local economy. It's been devastated by it. But because they're turning over money um, in taxes to the government, that they are getting away with it. And there's this total blinkering and like you say, if it was a farmer doing the same on land, he would be shut down tomorrow. But for some reason, it's just a racing horse blinkers that are on them. And it's 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 sad, but true. Yeah. David just wants to jump in on this, yeah? Yeah, I, I think, um, although what Scott said is the final solution, I think the one that will trigger that is to educate the public because people want cheap food, if they actually knew what buying um, farmed salmon from Sainsbury's, Tesco's, or even Waitrose, apparently, if they knew what it meant, I think they'd stop. And at some point, they should be made aware of it. I think some um, fishing organizations should picket supermarkets. Um, if a supermarket was running out of business because um, some lunatic environmentalists were picketing their shop, something would start to happen about it. It would get attention. At the moment, the general public is blissfully unaware of the problem. Mm. Now, we know about it. A lot of you know about it because it's of interest to you and your um, educated and interested parties. Um, 
housewife shopping at Sainsbury's knows nothing about it, so she buys the cheap farm salmon. Simple. And that's what they're trying to do with the artificial thing, is educate the people. I mean, that film is going, has been going all the way around the world with Michael Frodeen. Um, he's unfortunately not a Fallows this week, um, but the film will be shown. They're trying to educate people. If I can throw my two penneth worth in that, what I would like to see that film, yes, it's ideal to have it screened in Fallows and all that, but I want it on general release. I want it on every social yeah. media, everybody to share it. So mm. every member of public, if we, each one of us, with the social media and the friends and all that, and go out there, and the whole film showing the devastation that these farms are doing, and actually, you would actually get to a very broad spectrum of people. People, Yes, your friends and social media, but people that, you know, acquaintances and things like that. If everybody does it, and each one of us have got a responsibility. We've got to do something. Because if we don't, Scottish Shatman will no longer exist. Mm. And it's, I mean, there are other factors to it. But it's these fish farms are predominantly destroying yeah. the, the Scottish fa uh, uh, fishing industry. And people just don't care about it. So each one of us here, if, if that film is on general release, if it's out on social media, once it's done its world tour, then everybody then, a lot of people in the general public will actually be able to see and go, oh my God, that is actually, and as Scott said, if that was done on land, uh, any farmer absolutely. would be shut down overnight uh, because yeah. you would see the devastation. But because it's hidden under the water and people don't care. They re really, really don't care. So I think it is down to us to actually get that out, the word out there. And, and they don't, uh, the other thing is too, the housewives, they don't know, they want cheap food. If they saw exactly what yeah, that's, that's it was in thing. the fish, they wouldn't you wouldn't eat it. You really wouldn't. Or you feed know, it to your children. Or f uh, 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 definitely not to your children. You know, the salmon are pink. They're, they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, all know what a salmon looks like. We cut it open and it's that lovely pink colour. Because it's eating prawns and everything. All good goodness. A fish farm fish is white. It's like a cod. And they get a chart out where food die. They put in the foods. And they think, well, add this amount of food dye to get the right colour. And they're dyeing the flesh in the food so it dyes the meat. That's what that that's a reality. That's the truth of why it is. So you can't open a fish farm fish when it's swimming around, pure white. That's not natural. That's not a salmon, you know. And and, and if you see all the chemicals for for delousing and and to stop all the infection because they've got it all crowded together, uh, uh, all the antibiotics they're using within the fish, you you wouldn't f you wouldn't eat it, and you certainly wouldn't give it to your kids. You wouldn't. No. Wouldn't give it to your dog. No. no oh, no. ladies and gentlemen, uh, any. Any other panel wants to add anything quickly to that? Because we have run out of time. Um, folks, sorry to end on sort of qu quite a, a sour <laughs> note. Um, but it is true, something has to be done and we all need to be doing things and, and getting on our soapbox. Like David said, you know, picketing uh, supermarkets like that, if, if nothing's done, then, you know, it'll just be brushed under the carpet. But ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Thank the panel. Um, and... Before, before running away, uh, please come and join us in ten less than 10 minutes' time. Sorry, you two. Jeremy and Simon are going to have a head-to-head -head competition outside of the lake. So rather than fight the traffic, and come and join us down by the bells of hair there. It's going to be spinner versus fly. Um, it's a bit of fun. Unfortunately, the fly side ah. lost yesterday, so the pressure is all on Simon. Okay, so come and support. So if you're a fly angler, come and support Simon. <laughs> And come and support Jeremy as well, and we'll see who'll be. And uh, there was a few fish caught yesterday, so come and join us down there, and they'll be kicking off at three o'clock. Oh, well gosh. Well Are you going to tie your knots this time? I'm going to. I'm going to certainly check them. I, I've, <laughs> I've been waiting to.